Okay, so let's consider the formula for work again. So work equals force times displacement. Um, and let's consider particles undergoing a simple linear motion. Okay, um, this is going to seem like a pretty restrictive case, but this will give us a useful result that we'll be able to add to later. Um, okay, so if we have just ordinary particles, if we have an ordinary particle that um, a force is applied to, well, the force is just going to be its mass times acceleration. Okay, um, and the displacement, um, I'll just keep as a displacement for now. Um, but if we're assuming one dimensional motion, then um, the displacement will either be the same uh, direction or the opposite um, direction. Um, if we you know, want to make things easier, we can just assume that they're all positive. Um, in any case, we don't have to worry about the cosine theta if we have just linear motion. Okay, so I'm going to simplify this to just be mass times acceleration times the displacement in that direction. Okay, uh, for one dimensional motion, we would typically call S delta X. Okay, well, um, there are a lot of ways that we can manipulate this because we have a lot of formulas for um, the kinematics of linear motion. But if I make a particular choice, um, I'm going to use for acceleration the um, V final minus V initial over delta T. Okay, that's the definition of acceleration, um, assuming that we have a constant force, which we can assume um, for this case. The displacement, delta x, we could write in a variety of ways, but the one that I'm going to use is um, the average velocity, which is v final plus v initial divided by 2. Okay, we haven't shown that that's the average velocity, but I think it seems relatively reasonable that it is, um, and it turns out to be correct. Um, I just haven't shown it. Um, so the average velocity times the time over which it's moving. Okay, so that'll give us that displacement. Okay, so notice that we have a delta t in the denominator and a delta t in the numerator. So I can rearrange this a little bit and get m over 2 times vf minus vi times vf plus vi. Okay, so notice that this is um, going to come out to a difference of squares. If we just foil that, um, the vfs and vis out, then this is going to be m over 2 times vf squared minus vi squared. Okay, um, and finally, we can um, distribute the m over 2, and we'll have the formula 1 half m vf squared minus 1 half m vi squared, which remember was equal to the work. Okay, so we can give a name to this quantity, one half mv squared. Um, I'm going to call that the kinetic energy. So um, up to this point, there's no reason to think that there's anything special about it other than that it shows up in this formula and therefore it's kind of convenient. So um, final minus initial is the way we normally write a change. So the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy um, for simple particles undergoing linear motion. And it turns out that even if the motion is not linear, this is still true, although I didn't show it. So um, it is possible, obviously, to derive this rigorously, um, and that's why it's a theorem. Um, it's still only going to be true for particles, um, and we will add more details to this later. But notice what this shows. Um, this tells us that um, if work is zero, then the kinetic energy doesn't change. So one way to write this expression, um, in, to write it out in words, is that the kinetic energy is conserved if the work is zero. Um, and this is true specifically for particles. Okay, when we consider more complicated situations, we'll have to expand this a little bit. But notice that this is a conservation law. So um, I have a situation where I can say that, you know, if certain uh, conditions are met, then a quantity is conserved. And what we'll find is we can just add more and more to this as we go um, and, you know, get a better and better conservation law from it.